Today on the John Ankerberg Show, statistics show that about 70% of Christian young people who attend church regularly in high school will drop out or step away from their Christian faith when they leave to attend a secular college or university. Why are they leaving behind the faith in which they were raised? Students who enter the university quickly realize they're not in Sunday school anymore. Secular professors challenge their beliefs of how Christianity began, who Jesus really was. Can we believe that he rose from the dead? How did we get the Bible? And can we really trust the information we find there? 32% of Christian students said they left their faith behind because of intellectual skepticism or doubt. Their faith didn't make any sense to them anymore, or there were too many questions they didn't think could be answered. 63% of teenage Christians said they do not believe that Jesus is the son of the one true God. 51% said they do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 68% said they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a real entity. And only 33% said that the church will play a part in their lives when they leave home. But I believe this trend can be reversed. And so I've entitled our new television series, What Your Son or Daughter Needs to Know Before They Go to the University So They Don't Fall Away from the Faith. We will also help those watching the NBC television miniseries, AD, who have questions about the life of Jesus, his resurrection, and how the apostles spread the gospel. What evidence assures us that this all actually happened and was not fabricated by the early Christians? My guest today, who will lead us through this discussion, is Dr. Daryl Bach, one of the leading historical Jesus scholars in our country and one of the world's foremost authorities on the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He is Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary and has authored over 30 books and appeared on ABC, CNN, Fox, and the Discovery Channel. I invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're talking about what is it that your son, your daughter are hearing when you send them to the university or college, to a secular university or college. What are they hearing about God? What are they hearing about Jesus? What are they hearing about how the Bible comes down to us? This is crucial for you to know. It's crucial for them to know how to answer some of the questions that we're talking about. Otherwise, they can lose their faith. And one of the questions that comes up is, you know, how did the Bible come down to us? What is this thing, Scripture? And even further than that, you go back and you say, look, you had Jesus and you had the Old Testament and Jesus and the Jewish people thought you got the canon of the Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament. Where do the letters of the apostles and their books, when did the first Christians after Jesus start thinking, you know what? Paul's letters, Peter's letters, John's book, Luke. This is Scripture equal in weight with the Old Testament Scripture. Now, folks, right here, critical scholars, university professors, load up with all kinds of ideas of what happened after Jesus and what you ought to do with this information we call the 27 books of the New Testament. Daryl, tell me a few of the ideas that are being floated out there by the critics. Well, what's basically discussed in relation to the canon is a political process on the university campus where a certain group selected certain books that reflected their theology and the, their wing of the church the way they put it. Remember that for a critical scholar, for many of them there are alternative kinds of Christianities in the early centuries. And they built this scripture as kind of a fort to to support their orthodoxy. And this process is usually begins to be attributed to Irenaeus um, in the end of the second century, although more popularly, most people are familiar with the argument as Dan Brown formulated it, which is that it was a result of um, the creeds that came out in the late uh, fourth, in the fourth century and in the fifth century. So uh, obviously a much later process, 
obviously politically motivated with an agenda to crush the alternatives, that kind of thing. So it's part of a huge political battle. And what they'll point to, remember what we're talking about here are elements of, of the history that are pointed out and then it's given a certain twist. What they'll point to is you don't see the gospel writers citing one another directly earlier. You don't even see in the early second century uh, the New Testament being talked about as a concept. What you're getting is Paul said this or a gospel said that. And in any given work in the second century, you might see one or two of the gospels. You might see one or two of the epistles of Paul. There's nothing like a, you know, pulled together 27 books of the Bible functioning in that period. So I like to joke that, um, you know, what did, how did you teach theology uh, in the church, in a Bible church, before there was a Bible for the church? Uh, that's the situation that you're in. And so what happens is, is that they argue this, there's this political process. And so the question becomes, where did a scriptural consciousness come from? And then what was the process by which these books began to rise to the top? Well, what we see is these letters, some of them are being read in the churches as they're being written and circulated. Paul talks about reading certain of his letters in the churches. There's a respect for what it is that Paul's writing. Paul even uh, issues an anathema on certain people for the nature of the teaching that he's given and for the nature of the material that he's writing if it's not heated, that kind of thing. Yeah, let's give them a couple examples because the examples are going to come from some of the letters and books of the New Testament. But we're not saying accept this as inspired, the inspired Holy Word of God that came, dropped out of heaven and we've got it and therefore you don't have to ask any questions. We're saying this this information, these are the earliest bits of information that tell us how the Christians at that time period thought about things themselves, what they believed, what they held. And so we're taking it back and we're looking at their records just to find out what they said, okay? And let's find out what they said. Let's take uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. Peter says this, for you, talking to the Christians, have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all people are like grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field, and grass withers and the flowers fall. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. And then he goes on and says, and this is the Word of that was preached to you. What's Peter talking about? Oh man, this is so important. I can hardly, you know, I want, I want to jump up and down and say how important this is. What we are seeing, remember we said we were in an oral culture. An oral culture delivers the message verbally. The message that is being preached about the gospel is being called the Word of God. We tend to think of the Word of God as that which is inscripturated in the Bible. But here the Word of God is the message of the gospel that has come from God, that is a divine message, and it's being taught and preached. Peter says it. I think you have texts that are going to show other yep. writers say the same thing. And so what we've got is this oral strand of testimony that's coming through the apostolic message and the apostolic witness. What we get in the New Testament then is as these witnesses begin to die off and they can't speak and preach anymore, they become witnesses, and their witness is inscripturated in what becomes the New Testament and the Word of God. It's a, a very mind-blowing thought to think that when Paul or Peter or John spoke, that this was as solid, this was Scripture. But look at what we're told. It was Scripture it, before there was Scripture. That's right. Yeah. And look what, what it's talking about here in Acts 18.11, talking about Paul and he, Paul, stayed a year and six months doing what? Teaching what? The Word of God among them. And then again in Acts 13, verse 46, it says, And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the Word of God be spoken first to you. Now, again, explain that. Well, again, here we have Luke's testimony of, of terminology that Paul and Barnabas are using. We're actually going to point to a text in a minute in which Paul says it directly himself. So not only are we getting this oral word of God that is the message that ends up being inscripturated, but also what we're getting is multiple witnesses to this concept in the early church. We've cited Peter. This is Luke speaking. 
We're going to talk about Paul in a minute. We're going to have a witness from John. So what we're doing is we're building up the fact that this was a, a we talked about core theology in the church. This is a core doctrine within that core theology in which the word of God is being delivered when the message of the gospel is being given. That is the core theology that's driving this. And what the New Testament is, is a witness to that core theology. Yeah, let's take the, the Apostle John here in the book of Revelation. Everybody's kind of read the first couple chapters at least of the book of Revelation. And right there in chapter 1, this is what John says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance of that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. Why? On account of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's arrested because he's preaching the gospel. That's basically what that is saying. That this is a message that reflects God's program and God's plan to deliver humanity. And he's in jail, if you will, uh, in exile, uh, writing the book of Revelation, and at Patmos because of his preaching of that message. Daryl, here's a very interesting one from the Apostle Paul, who in 1 Timothy 5 says, For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, which is a quote from the Old Testament, and the laborer deserves his wages, which is a quote from Luke in the Gospel of Luke. Or at least Jesus is teaching through the tradition. It's yeah. one or the other. But what he does, well, tell us what he does right here. Well, what he's doing, obviously, is he's equating uh, Scripture of the Old Testament with the teaching of Jesus, teaching of Jesus as we see it in Luke. Uh, it's putting the two together. Now, again, I've got to issue a caveat. You share this text to show this in an early period tied to Paul. You're going to get the reply, well, Paul didn't write 1 Timothy. That's what a skeptic's going to do with it. And you're into another discussion. But I'd like to say, let's assume for the sake of argument that Paul didn't write 1 Timothy. We still have a first century witness to the fact that Old Testament and New Testament texts or Old Testament texts and Word of God, Jesus Word texts are being put side by side and equated with one another and they're being called Scripture. That there, there's something that is recorded that has authority that's operating in the church, in the tradition of the church that's being passed on in this passage. Yeah. All right. I mean, folks, just listen to what's happening here in these early witnesses of, of the people that were on the scene, the apostles and folks that were saying, we're equating this as Scripture. We're saying this is the Word of God. These letters that are in the New Testament are the earliest sources we have that are telling you what the early Christians believed themselves and what they said. You can't go any further than that. And so, Daryl, I want to take this verse here of Paul in the book of Galatians. How early did Galatians come out? To Galatians is, early, well, Galatians is debated depending on which part of Galatia it's written to, but we're in the 50s. We're in the early 50s. Yeah, so you're talking, you know, uh, 20 years after Jesus, and Paul makes this statement admonishing those at Galatia. I'm astonished, Paul says, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Then Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. And if they didn't get the first time, he then repeated that, Darrell. What does that mean about the gospel message? What Paul is arguing is that the gospel message that he brings and the gospel message that the apostles bring is the gospel message. It does not change. What we see in the New Testament is discussion about the theology that grows out of that core. And certainly what you see in different writers are different emphases in developing different implications around what that core gospel is. But this core gospel is fixed. That's why, going back to what we did earlier, that's why when you have the sacraments and you sit at the Lord's table, you're de declaring the Lord's death until He comes. That's why when you participate in baptism, you're being washed and cleansed to show the gift of life that comes in the provision of the Spirit that gives you life forever. That's what the gospel is. And this comes through Jesus Christ, not just in a death for sin, because what death for sin does is clean the slate 
so that now God can come into your life and impact you in terms of who you are and the way you walk with him in the future. So what we are seeing is the, de is the delivery of a core theology that isn't changing. Now the reflection on it is endless because the gospel is profound. But the core theology is there from the beginning and it's not changing. And even though there's a pushback that Paul is sensing, there are opponents here that he's dealing with who are trying to frame the gospel differently. He's saying if you're connected to me and if you're connected to the apostolic group that walked and talked with Jesus, this is the gospel. Yeah. In Galatians, he's admonishing them because he told them the first time they, they're slipping away from that. Okay. So he's bringing them back. He does this again with the, with the, the church at Corinth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, and here's a book that on the newsstands at 55, he's talking about when he preached to them at 50. So now we're 20 years off of Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. And again, the point that he's making here is this isn't his gospel personally. This is a gospel that he is passing on that he received as a part of tradition. He shares it with the other apostles. This idea that the resurrection is central to the hope is part of this core theology that he is now going to defend in chapter 15 in some detail. And so the idea that Jesus is raised and vindicated by God, shown to be who he is, shown to be later on in the chapter in 1 Corinthians, shown to be the second Adam, reversing that which put creation in chaos and reversing that, having the opportunity to come out of that chaos, that's what Jesus Christ offers in this salvation and that's what he's talking about. In talking about, you know, did this faith evolve? Did this doctrine change? Did the whole story about Christ, was it invented? No, no, no. You have Jude, the brother of James, the brother of Jesus, basically. And Jude writes just one little page of Scripture, a letter. And in this he says, Friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, he says, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith. And then he has this interesting phrase that was once for all, delivered to the saints. Now, I've heard some guys say this is about 65. Others say, we'll take it up to 80. Regardless, 80, the faith's been delivered, buddy. It's there, and he's expecting them to defend it. Yeah, I think it's very, very important to get a picture of what's going on here in light of what we also have in the New Testament. What we're arguing is there's a core theology. That core theology goes back to the apostles and to Jesus. The apostles are witnesses to what it is that Jesus taught. That's there, that's fixed. But what we're seeing in the New Testament and the New Testament books are people reflecting on what this core is all about, where it comes from, what it tells us about God, what it tells us about salvation, what it tells us about Jesus, what it tells us about the Spirit, what it tells us about the world, what it tells us about Israel, what it tells us about the future, all kinds of things. Well, those rays are going out in all kinds of directions. And what we see in the New Testament in the things that scholars call development is the working out of the implications of what's emanating from this core. And yes, certain writers talk about this feature of what's emanating from the core. Other writers talk about that feature of what's emanating from the core. They look at, at things from different angles. A great example is James and Paul on faith and works. Paul's asking the question, what does it take to get in? It takes faith. James is looking back and says, what does faith look like down the road? It has a product. Okay, they aren't in disagreement with one another. They're looking at it from different time frames. So you get differences. I don't want to don't want to leave the sense that in saying it's once for all or it's one thing, it's all monotone. No, it has depth. And in that depth, you're getting the variation of the implications that are drawing out with some writers emphasizing some things and other writers emphasizing the other. And there is you can talk about that kind of development in the in what you see in the New Testament. But it's all drawing back to this core, this hub out of which it's coming. Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. The core theology has been delivered to the saints. That's exactly right. And he also, he follows it up, you know, 14 verses later, and he says, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken before and by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, you know... The apostles had the scoop. They're the authoritative ones. What they said was scripture based. And what's happening with the New Testament is as our apostles are dying off and we no longer have their living word that can function in an oral context, we're now going to inscripturate their testimony. 
So we get Matthew and John writing as apostles, presenting that material and the material that comes through them. We have Mark representing Peter. We have Luke representing really the whole church in many ways. And, and that's where our Gospels come from. We have the epistles that are written to deliver the testimony as Paul is seeing it and preaching it. And we have Peter's material that comes from, from obviously one of the close apostles. We have John's material that comes from him. And, and Hebrews... We don't even know who the author is, but what he said was so good, it got in there too. Summarize the programs that we've done in trying to help students feel confident about the information that we do have about Jesus, about the message of the gospel, about how we got scripture, and about the resurrection. What we're arguing is, is that there's a core theology that was there from the beginning. You see that in all our early witnesses. Those witnesses with their doctrinal summaries, with their songs, with their sacraments, pull the gap back from the time in which the documents are written right on top of the events themselves. They are in touch with one another. Jesus' ministry and the apostles' preaching touch at that point. That's what we're saying. It's a credible explanation. Yes, there's variation that you see in the Scripture in terms of what gets emphasized, but that's because the implications of what Jesus has done streams out in all directions and has all kinds of depth to it. And so what we're saying is, is that the core gospel idea is what the early church called the Word of God in the first century. That's the message that they delivered, and that message was a revelation from God that said, you can be restored into a relationship with God because through Jesus Christ He offers forgiveness and gives you something you cannot provide for yourself. Not just forgiveness of sins, but access to the Father through an enablement that comes through the life that He gives in the Spirit of God that connects you to God forever and that gives you everlasting life. It's eternal life not only in duration, it's eternal life in quality. It comes from the Eternal One. And you can reconnect in fellowship and, and really uh, come back into creation the way it was designed to be. That actually is the core message of the Gospel which the early church called the Word of God. Yeah. And folks, whether you're 15 years old, 25 years old, 50 years old, or 80 years old, whatever spectrum of life that you're in, the evidence shows Jesus is who He claimed to be. He actually did rise from the dead. He's living now. He's the Savior of the world. He wants to save you. And somewhere along the line, you need to think about Him and you need to decide, are you going to invite Him? to be your savior? Are you going to ask him to change you, to forgive your sins? You've got to decide that. I hope that you'll decide it right now. And folks, I want you to stay tuned so you can understand how you can get all of this material for yourself. So listen. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. Now, if you would like to have all of the information in our new series called questions the world will ask about your faith. All three television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $39. It contains the information your son or daughter needs to know before they leave home and go off to attend a secular college or university. And it features one of the world's leading historical Jesus scholars, Dr. Daryl Bach. In this series, we'll help those watching the NBC television miniseries A.D., who have questions about the life of Jesus, His death and resurrection, and how the apostles spread the gospel to the world. What evidence assures us that this all actually happened and was not fabricated by the early Christians? And what evidence shows Jesus clearly claimed to be God? How do we know Jesus really rose from the dead and actually appeared to over 500 people? Can the resurrection appearances be explained away by psychological theories? All three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $39. We also taped a second series called So You Don't Fall Away from the Faith. In this series we explain how did Christianity begin? How do we know that the information in the New Testament books is the best historical evidence there is for what Jesus said and did? And then how do we know we can trust what we are told about Jesus? Was the message Jesus preached changed over time by the early Christians? Or has Jesus' core message remained the same until our day? How did the early Christians come to believe that the apostles' books and letters were to be considered scripture 
equal in authority with the Old Testament scriptures? And who decided which books would become part of the canon? The three programs in this series are also available on DVD for a gift of $39. Then third, we are making available two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series. Each study guide is available for a gift of $8 or for five or more copies for $5 each. And finally, I'm going to include three other important series in this package. First, the battle to dethrone Jesus. Could the apostles and companions of the apostles have written a completely new story about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? During the early period of time, when the early Christians did not have the New Testament, how did they know what was true Christian belief and what was not? Well, the four programs in this series with New Testament scholars, Dr. Daniel B. Wallace and Dr. Daryl Bach, answer all of these questions. Second, our series, What About the Missing Gospels and Lost Christianities? Is the traditional Orthodox Christianity that we were taught in church true Christianity? What about the missing Gospels and alternative Christianities that archaeologists have discovered? What do books like the Da Vinci Code, which sold more than 81 million copies, and other popular literature teach about Jesus? What historical evidence refutes their assertions? And then third, a response to Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus, Part 1 and Part 2. My guests again are historian Dr. Gary Habermas and New Testament scholar Dr. Daryl Bach, who critique Bill O'Reilly's view of Jesus that's portrayed in his book and in his upcoming movie, which Bill O'Reilly says will break new ground in chronicling the life of the most famous human being who ever lived. Now, all six of these television series, containing 22 half-hour programs, plus the two study guides, are available for a gift of only $99. You may order this special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. We may also order these materials at our website at jashow.org. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show, Sharia comes from two things. One is the, the precepts of the Quran, and secondly is the example of Muhammad. When you blend those two together, you get what is the constitution of Islam. It deals with how you dress, when you go to war, who you're going to marry, how you do finances. It is your jurisprudence. It is your constitution. to learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.